Some 23 million light years away from here, two gigantic galaxies with billions of stars have smashed into each other and are swirling in a cosmic whirlpool as we speak. A phenomenon this global cannot remain unseen for too long. Myriads of photons escape the whirlpool every second, delivering the message throughout the universe. Some of those were captured by our telescopes, digitally imaged and are now being recreated by your screen. We could spend minutes staring at this image in awe, but as scientists, we ought to go deeper. Let us start with the basics. Just how much information does this image contain? Lights on. The quantity determining how much an observer can see on the image is known as resolution. It is determined by the minimum angular distance an object can occupy on the image. If two objects, say two stars, were to be closer to each other than this minimum distance, there would be no way of telling that they are separate. To calculate the resolution of any telescope, we need a simple formula. The minimum resolvable angle is directly proportional to the wavelength of light used and inversely proportional to the diameter of the primary lens of the telescope, also known as the aperture. The largest telescope at the University College London Observatory, Radcliffe, has a 600mm wide lens. Substituting the numbers gives us the resolution of 0.2 arc seconds. Or, at least, that's what you expect until you actually go to the observatory and take a closer look at the images you took. Here's mine. This picture is approximately 2 arc minutes or 120 arc seconds across. Do you see that bright star in the centre? Well, if we measure its radius, we get more than 3 arc seconds. This is 15 times worse than our predictions. To understand what is actually going on, we will have to look inside the telescope. Good idea! Let us zoom out. Here is our planet, and somewhere on the left are the colliding galaxies. The galaxies emit massive quantities of light. In fact, they emit enough light to cover the entire surface of the Earth, and much, much more. Alas for us, Human eyes are just too small and can collect only a tiny fraction of that light at any given moment of time. If only we could enlarge our eyes to accommodate all this information coming from the other edge of the universe. Here, the story of a telescope begins. And it begins with a piece of glass. The thing is, any transparent material has this amazing property of bending light, also known as refraction. We can demonstrate it with a laser beam. See? It bends, and it bends in a way that is very easy to predict with a little bit of mathematics. The relation is known as Schnell's law, and it basically says that the ratio of sines of angles is proportional to the ratio of speeds of light in the materials involved. Although the details are slightly more involved, we can use this equation to calculate the shape of glass we need to collect multiple light rays at a single point. And that shape looks like this. Now we just have to place our eye at the intersection of light rays and enjoy the supervision. Well, not so fast. Our eyes have lenses too, which means that they would prefer to converge light rays themselves. If the rays had been converged already, our lenses will only mess things up. Not a big deal. Let's get another lens in front of our eyes to diverge the rays back and let the eyes do their job in whichever the way they want. The important point is that we managed to compress a lot of light in a tiny region of space that can be easily captured by our small eyes. Also, if we are to make a telescope, we'd better protect it from external lights and dust, put it on a tripod and connect it to a guiding computer. Now with so much light, the picture is brighter and we can afford to spread the light we have over large surface areas, thereby increasing magnification. Now our colliding galaxies, instead of looking like this, look like this. And it is this compression of light inside a small region of space that gives birth to our biggest problem, finite resolution. For our purposes, we can model light as waves. It means that light can interfere with itself, cancel itself out, and most importantly, it will want to spread out after passing through a narrow slit. This phenomenon is known as diffraction. After passing through the aperture of our telescope, light rays will spread out amplifying each other at some places and silencing each other at others. In the end, instead of perfectly sharp images of stars, we get blurry diffraction patterns that can easily hide other objects, thereby making us fail to resolve them. Fortunately, the wavelength of light is typically very small. Let me show you the diffraction equation again. Small wavelengths mean very small diffraction patterns. This is why we do not see our world in blurred concentric rings. However, 
when we use our telescopes to observe objects at very high levels of magnification, this limitation becomes very significant. But if we take another look at the equation, we can immediately see how to fix it. The aperture of the telescope is in the denominator. When it's large, the spread angle is very small. This is why we have to build bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger telescopes. One problem remains unsolved. Why is this picture of resolution 15 times less than it should be according to our equation? Young girl, this is trivial. Our lens is not the only material capable of refraction. So is the air in our atmosphere with one significant difference. We cannot tell the air around us to arrange its molecules in the shape of a lens that would bring stellar images in perfect focus. It would be so much better if we could send UCLO to outer space. Thank you for being with us. Keep looking up. Lights off.